New York, January 1959. Scene of the most daring sleep deprivation experiment ever attempted. Disc jockey Peter Tripp decided to raise money for charity by staying awake for 200 hours, eight days and nights. If successful, it was to be the longest period of uninterrupted wakefulness ever recorded. I don't think anyone thought Peter Tripp was going to stay awake more than two or three days. Have you ever tried to stay awake before an exam for one night? It kills you. <laughs> well, hey, days is impossible. Oh, pardon me. How about you kids? Do you think that might be a hit song? Rosemary June, I'll always be in love with you. We think it's just tremendous. Inventor of the top 40 and a pioneer of TV pop shows, Tripp was the most successful DJ in America. His radio station asked a young sleep researcher to supervise the experiment. I thought that this was certainly a risk. I tried very hard to persuade them not to do it because I felt certain from my own studies that significant harm could um, uh, be a consequence. In 1953, Jolly West had been a young psychiatrist working at a U.S. Air Force base in Texas. He treated a group of American pilots who'd been captured by Chinese communists in the Korean War. The Chinese had tortured the prisoners by preventing them from sleeping. I felt that some of the Air Force POWs had not recovered their former personality function after they returned. Uh, they told me that they weren't themselves. Aware of the psychological damage suffered by the American airmen, scientists in the late 50s shied away from sleep deprivation experiments. But Peter Tripp was determined to go ahead. Jolly went to New York and talked with Peter Tripp, and he said, this is a dangerous thing to do. No one's ever done this before, and you may be in trouble. It may end up that you're going to have physical problems or mental problems. No matter else, what's going to happen? Do you still want to do this? And Peter Tripp said, yeah, he's going to do it. They got back in touch with me again and said, uh, Mr. Tripp is going ahead with this in any case. Will you be a consultant? And I thought, well, if he's going to do it, it shouldn't be wasted. This is one of the most listened to shows around the country. And according to all facts and figures, this is the most listened to, the most popular, the most everything record of the year. On January 20th, 1959, Tripp launched his attempt to break the world record for sleeplessness. To maximize publicity for the March of Dimes charity, he broadcast his show from a studio in the middle of Times Square. He was a very cheerful, upbeat guy, and that's what we observed at the very beginning. He called himself, uh, Mother's Little Curly-Head Boy. <laughs> and away he went. He would spin his records, not four hours a day, but 24 hours a day, and he would chatter and answer his phone calls and do the whole disc jockey's shtick. I got myself all geared up to use Polaroid films to take a picture of Peter Tripp every hour as long as he stayed awake. Well, it worked. Good people, right now we're gonna kinda close off with something that we think is about as pretty as a record can be. It's instrumental, I think it will be the first big smash hit of 1959. While New Yorkers listened in their millions, the doctors kept Tripp under constant observation. As the hours mounted, it became harder for them to keep him awake. When studies are of sleep deprivation are done, I always wonder what measures they took to keep the person awake. Because when we studied Peter Tripp, that was our objective, to make absolutely certain that he stayed awake, and we did. I had the graveyard shift. From midnight till 8 o'clock in the morning, I had my eyes focused on that guy because after two or three days, you can imagine, he wanted to play games, you know. He'd want me to look out the window at something. <laughs> well, he'd catnap a few seconds. We never did do that. We wouldn't let him do this. 
he would say, now I'll just go to the bathroom a few minutes, and it'll be out. We said, oh, we're going to go to the bathroom with you. Oh, he was mad and incensed, but finally he said, we said, look, if you got the bathroom to sit down, you're going to go to sleep, don't you know? The whole experiment's over. Oh, he said, okay. So as inconvenient and as awkward as it was, we were with this man constantly. By the third day, Tripp's behavior had begun to change. He was abusing everyone around him, even his barber, who he'd known for years. Peter began cursing the barber, really being terrible to him and insulting him, and the barber cried. <laughs> he didn't understand this. He began crying when Peter cursed him, and later he didn't come back. Tripp was given a full medical examination every day. The first physical change, doctors noted, was a dramatic drop in his body temperature. Many times he would sit in this warm booth with his overcoat on and his hat pulled down. That, that was a complete change for Peter Tripp. His mean body temperature progressively declined over this period of time. And the lower it went, the crazier he got. Tripp had begun to see things that weren't there. He mistook one of the doctors for an undertaker who'd come to bury him. He ran into the street, terrified. He bolted out of the door. I chased him. He ran across in heavy traffic. I just missed being hurt. I had to tackle him to, being, to keep him from being killed by a taxi. By the fifth day, Tripp began to lose his hold on reality. Dr. West was growing concerned. He began to have periods of uh, frank hallucinations where he would be hearing voices. At first, the medical team were puzzled by the hallucinations, but then they made a surprising discovery. When we sleep, we enter a period of REM sleep every 90 minutes. It's during this stage that we dream. Tripp's brainwaves showed that although he was awake, the hallucinations were shadowing the 90-minute cycle of dream sleep. There was a 90-minute cycle of uh, relative confusion and relative clarity that would ebb and flow and during the time that he would, if he were sleeping, have had uh, REM sleep, those were the times he was most likely to hallucinate. It was as though he were having dreams uh, some of them with even a nightmarish quality, even though he was awake. He began seeing spiders in his shoes. And he talked about them, was fearful of this. He actually could see these spiders in his shoes. He'd take off his shoes and look inside them and say, the, 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 those are spiders. See those spiders in there? 